So we are in lecture number nine. It's already April. Spring is on or almost. And we are going to be talking about, continue talking about the topic of business process redesign. Uh, so if I uh, situate you with respect to the, the outline of the course, we are pretty much halfway. Uh, we have gone through identifying processes, discovering processes, analyzing those processes. And we are in full in the topic of redesigning a business process. And we have already started with that topic uh, last week when I introduce you to, um, uh, um, let's say, a paradigm for uh, identifying, for discovering how you can change a process called business process reengineering. And we saw that business process reengineering, what it does, it says, like, it tells you like, okay, have a look at how the process looks like. And once you have done it, put it aside and let's rethink the process from scratch. Let's see what is the outcome that we want to obtain from the process. And let's try to apply a number of business process reengineering principles in order to come up with a new blueprint for the process. Uh, for example, one of those is like, whatever information you need in the process in order to achieve its outcome, you should capture that information once, only once, and at the source, if possible, for that, you should use uh, self-service, you know, so that the person who needs something is the one who enters the data for it. And uh, you need to use um, shared databases to share uh, the data across the different actors of the process. And then you start redesigning completely your process from, from scratch. Uh, so that, that is good in situations where you really have a very broken process, probably processes that are not yet um, properly digitized, uh, where the data is not being captured and shared as it should. In most situations, however, that's kind of already taken care of. So let me refer, for example, to the pharmacy prescription fulfillment process that you are handling in your, um, a, in your, in, in your homeworks. Uh, in that pharmacy prescription process, there is already a pharmacy information system. So, and there is already a possibility for uh, customers of this process um, the people who have the prescriptions and need to fill them up, uh, those customers can already go through a web online form and enter the prescription uh, uh, themselves into a form. Um, there are some hiccups in the process. Uh, there are some duplicate data transfers, data, data entries taking place. Um, sometimes you have the information, but it's not properly being used. Uh, but the blueprint of the process is not that bad after all. So in those situations like this pharmacy prescription process, there is perhaps no real need to go and completely destroy the existing process and build a new one. You can incrementally, you can try to make incremental small changes to your existing process. I'm gonna to introduce today one particular technique for redesigning processes called heuristic process redesign. Heuristic means it's based on a set of sort of recipes, you know, that tell you like, if you change the process in this way, you can improve the, you can reduce costs, but maybe you will decrease quality. If you change your process in that other way, you might decrease time, but you might increase cost, etc. So I'm going to introduce you essentially to um, nine techniques or heuristics it's called for process redesign, each of which is meant to improve you along one performance dimension that could be cost, for example, but will make you worst, perhaps worst along another dimension. So every one of these heuristics embeds a trade-off between four dimensions of performance of a process. Three of them, we have seen them already, cost, time, and quality, and a fourth dimension of process performance known as 
flexibility. This, these four dimensions of performance are related uh, with each other. They have an interplay that we usually capture by talking about the devil's quadrangle. The devil's quadrangle is a sort of toy, a mechanical toy, that when you try to improve it, meaning make it, pull it in one of the dimensions upwards or to the right or to the left, it will become smaller on the other dimension. And, and, I, I, and I, I put the devil's quadrangle as a metaphor here because everything we will do today will be about saying like, if you, if you do this, if you add a task in this way in your process, you will improve the cost, you will improve the cost, which means you will reduce cost, but you will decrease the quality. You will improve time, but you will decrease flexibility. So before proceeding further, let me talk to you about this fourth dimension of performance that we haven't seen until now. We have talked about time performance, cycle time, waiting times. We have talked about cost per instance, resource costs, etc. We have talked about defect rates, which is a measure of quality. And flexibility is kind of new in the, into the equation. Uh, it's a kind of a very important performance dimension in the long run. It's one of those things that if you don't have it, it will not affect you today, but it will affect you at some point in time. Um, and it's something that every uh, organization needs to try to embed into their processes. And that's called flexibility. So flexibility is, is a dimension of performance of your process. You want your process to be more flexible. And it's, it, re, it's a, it's, it reflects the ability for your business process to react to changes in the environment, specifically changes in the workload. So if suddenly you start receiving twice more purchase orders, is your process able to handle it? Uh, changes in the customer demands and expectations. So if customers start to expect that you serve them faster because there is a new competitor across the street and they are doing things faster than you, is your process able to be going faster? Uh, and a, what happens, for example, if there is an epidemic and 20% of your staff members fall sick and they are not able to come to work? Is your process able to cope with uh, these um, changes in the availability of your human resources? Um, so, for example, let me give you an example. So there was at some point in time I was involved in a, in a project with an insurance company. And this insurance company um, a, was, had a, an insurance claims handling process as any insurance company. So it's the process that gets triggered when one of their customers uh, has an incident. For example, their house um, got hit by a hailstorm and half of the roof got broken. So the customer calls and lodges um, uh, a claim, an insurance claim, or they go to their internet website and they lodge a claim. At the time, customers were more into calling to, to uh, lodge their claim rather than going to the internet. Uh, and uh, uh, this company needed, uh, had over time done a lot of improvements to their process. Their process was very highly efficient. The cost of handling every claim had gone down very significantly in the past three years their cycle times were very fast. You know, they were able to respond to customers within 24 hours. They were able to uh, resolve, uh, settle a claim within five days. Um, they were fulfilling all their service level objectives. Um, and, uh, but they, they realized a bit too late, they had a problem. At some point in time, there, were, there was a very big storm happening in one of the main cities covered by this uh, insurance company. And it kind of created a flood of insurance claims. And they were unable to keep up with that flood of insurance claims. And some of the customers whose house was destroyed by the storm had sometimes to wait for weeks, if not months, to get their claim resolved, uh, their insurance claim resolved. 
And of course, that cost them a lot of customers going out. What happened was that they had been thinking for several years about how to improve cost, how to improve in time, how to improve in quality, but they had not been thinking about how to improve in terms of flexibility or resilience to changes in the workload. So when they suddenly got a lot of additional workload, they were not able to adapt to that sufficiently quickly. And, and, and that really had a very high cost to them. And they triggered a whole, process, a whole improvement effort to, in the future, improve their flexibility with respect to these uh, incidents. And it, it paid off because a couple of years later, there was a flood in the same city. And that also created a lot of insurance claims. And this time they were able to handle them much more efficiently. And I'm gonna tell you a few things that you can do if you want to improve the flexibility of your process. So let me introduce you today with nine heuristics or call them recipes if you want for how you can change a business process to address different types of performance issues related to cost, quality, time, and flexibility. And I divide these nine heuristics into three groups. Uh, the first group of heuristics is the task level heuristics because they tell you how to adapt individual tasks in your process in order to address different performance issues. The second category of redesign heuristics are the flow level heuristics. There are two of them, and they tell you how you can rearrange the flow in your process, like how you can change the order of tasks in order to improve the performance of the process. And the third type of heuristics operate at the process level, so not at the level of individual tasks or their order, but at the level of how the entire process is arranged in terms of how the actors in the process communicate with each other, how the actors are allocated to tasks in the process and how uh, the tasks in the process get uh, coordinated or automated. So let me start with the three redesign heuristics. This is going to be a little bit tricky. I'm going to try as much as possible to give you some clues that will allow you when you do your homework to come back to one particular slide they can say, yeah, here, there might be some heuristics I can apply. So let me start with the three task level heuristics. In a business process, as far as individual tasks in the process are concerned, you can do three things. You can remove a task or, by the way, do the opposite. You can add a task. You can take two tasks in the process and merge them or the opposite, you can take a task and break it into two pieces. Or there, is, there are two ways, as you will see, of breaking a task into pieces. One of them is what we call decomposition. And the second one is called triage. And triage is the third task level redesign heuristic. Let me go concrete, introduce each of these three heuristics and give you some examples. The first thing you will want to do if you want to improve the cycle time of a process, or if you want to improve the cost of a process, reduce cost, is to eliminate tasks, or at least to somehow eliminate some of the steps that you execute within a task. And we saw in lecture number six, about three weeks ago, that um, there are three types of steps in a process, value adding steps, business value adding steps, and non-value adding steps. And the non-value adding steps are the steps that you basically, fundamentally, you don't need to do. Now you are doing them because of the design of your process, but you don't need to do them. The customer doesn't care and the business doesn't care. Um, so you will go after those tasks. So everywhere, when you did the value adding analysis, everywhere where you saw transportation, everything where you saw stuff being sent, received, forwarded, etc. you will try to figure out how can you eliminate that step in the process, or at least 
how can you make it as transparent as possible so that the workers in the process don't spend time doing those, those steps, uh, so that those steps do not consume any effort from the process. So that's the first thing you would do in a process. So for example, um, a, if you have um, if you have a process where a given worker gives work to another one, and then that worker gives back work to the first one, you will try to see how can I avoid this back and forth? Can I can I reroute the flow in the process so that I don't have these ping pongs like one person gives work to the second and the second gives work back to the first one? Can I just give the work straight to the second one and then back to the first one instead of doing like from from person A to B to C, from C to B and from B to C, can I go from A to C and to B? Like that, more straightforward. So that's the first thing you need to think about in a process. The second type of step that you can try, maybe not to eliminate, but to streamline, we call it, is the business value adding steps. Very often, and you will notice it in your homework number two, Business value adding steps are steps where you check for something. For example, in a prescription fulfillment process, you will be doing verifications or checks for potential drug to drug interactions, so called DUR or DUR interactions. And this step is necessary for the business. It's a business value adding step. It reduces the risk that the pharmacy will serve the wrong drug to a customer and the customer will later take the pharmacy to court and get some compensation for that. So it's reducing risk. Uh, and, uh, a, and whenever you have such steps, you probably cannot eliminate them, but you will try to automate them. And sometimes you cannot automate a verification step completely, but you can semi-automate it. So for example, uh, a you might want to say that we are going to do the, this task where we check for the drug-drug interaction. We're going to do like an automated check. And sometimes the automated check is enough, like the drugs that are being served don't really have any interactions with other drugs, nor any strong secondary effects. So we can just go straight and serve those drugs. It's very safe. Or, or the drugs that are there have very strong interactions with other drugs or are really bad for people who suffer from hypertension. Uh, so if we see that this person, for example, is in an age group where they suffer from hypertension, we will go and um, try to do a manual check to figure out if, if we can really give this drug to this person. In the existing pharmacy prescription process that you are analyzing in your homeworks, that has already been done. The process is already designed as in the bottom of this slide. There is an automated check that tries to you know, treat the easy cases. It handles the easy cases. And then there is a manual check for the more uh, sophisticated checks. But you can, you can keep going and applying this principle a little bit in a more uh, sophisticated manner. And you can go to a second level. Even these manual checks that are currently being done in the pharmacy it's possible perhaps to split them into multiple categories. Those that require doctor interventions, those that do not require doctor intervention. So this can give you some ideas on how to further improve the process in that area. Uh, examples of how you would do task elimination in a purchase to pay process, for example, um, instead of whenever you have a purchase to make, asking the supervisor or possibly two different people for approval, you know, companies will typically set some rules and say, look, certain people in the, in the organization, you know, have the right to trigger purchases. Uh, for example, because a, a, I broke my webcam and I need a new one and they can trigger purchases of up to hundred euros or 500 euros. And those purchases don't need to be approved one by one. You know, they are like pre-approved. Uh, up to a certain amount, you can trigger purchases. It has to go through the purchasing process, but it does not need approvals. In an, in an order to cash process, for example, um, 
it's often the case that invoices are checked one by one. Um, you will be very surprised to know um, that there are a lot of large companies receive a lot of duplicate invoices, two times the same invoice. If they don't pay attention, they sometimes pay twice the same thing. And you will also be surprised um, to know that there is a lot of invoice fraud going on in the real world. Uh, companies receiving uh, fake invoices or you know, looking like real invoices, etc. cetera. So, so organizations have to be very rigorous about the way they handle invoice, inbound invoices and the way they pay them. Uh, but you know, for certain types of suppliers that are very well trusted, where we have a long-term relation and where we have a very well, a very secure channel for communicating with them, uh, we can say that, look, invoices you send me below 1,000, we will not check them one by one. We will just send them through payment. And later, we will maybe check a sample of those invoices instead of checking every one of them. That could be useful, for example, in the context of this equipment rent uh, construction company that we saw before in some of the previous uh, lab sessions. That company uh, needs to buy, uh, rent a lot of equipment. I mean, it would be crazy to have to check every one of these uh, stuff. So they, they could be like that if I receive an invoice from this rental company with which I have a long-term relations and it's below 500 euros, then I would normally just uh, pay it without triple checking it. So that's what the first redesign heuristic tells you. It tells you, is there anything in your process that you could try to eliminate, if not completely, at least for 50% of the cases in your process? Is, is there a way that some of the tasks might should? Is there a way to skip some of the tasks, not to perform some of the tasks for every case in your process? And the guidelines are, when applying these redesign heuristics, go for your... Um, uh, no value adding steps first, tries to hit them to the ground and eliminate them, and then go for your business value adding steps and try to see to what extent you can skip those steps in some cases, or at least you can semi-automate them or automate them. The second redesign heuristic that we will see today is task composition, and the reverse is task decomposition. This heuristic tells you that you should consider merging tasks when, there, when the merging of these tasks allows you to remove some transportation waste. Or conversely, in some cases, it might be good to split the task into two tasks, particularly when a task requires two different types of skill sets and it's better to have two different people to perform them. Uh, for example, in a purchase to pay process where you make a purchase and it has to be approved, it's often the case that you need to, two types of approvals. You need to an approval to figure out if this purchase is necessary. So one of the supervisors will look at it and say, yes, we need this webcam or no, we don't need this webcam. We could just reallocate another webcam to you because you just broke yours. So we shouldn't purchase a new one. And the second types of verifications that need to be done is, is there a budget for it? You know, do we have money for it? Uh, so, and where, from where, which budget in the organization are we going to pay for this uh, new webcam? Um, and so there are two types of checks and in some purchase to pay processes, some organizations, these two checks are performed by two separate people. And that slows down the process a lot because I do want, you know, let's say I want to purchase something. I fill in a form, a purchase requisition form it's called. It goes to one person who has to check for the necessity of the purchase. That person might not be available straight away. So maybe I have to wait until the next day for that person to come on board. That person makes the checking for the necessity of the purchase. And then it passes on to the next person. And the next person will start looking 
Do we have the budget for it, etc.? Again, that person might not be available straight away, but only a couple of hours later. And in all this chain of approvals, I might have lost two days or two days where I didn't have a webcam. I couldn't do my Zoom calls uh, with the webcam. Uh, so so that, that's an example of where you might be considering merging these two tasks, checking the necessity of the purchase and checking to the budget being done by the same supervisor in a single go um, so that you can avoid this transportation waste, which causes additional waiting times in your process. Let me give you an example of where you will do the opposite. I actually, this is a real world example. I once uh, was a, advising um, a company where they had a so-called make to order process. A make to order process is an order to cash process. It's a, you receive purchase orders and you serve them. And, but a make to order process has a special twist to it. Uh, you don't have the products in your inventory and when somebody asks you, you just ship them, you actually have to produce the products. This is very typical, for example, in metal, metal manufacturing, metallic manufacturing companies or wooden manufacturing companies, like companies that manufacture um, a furniture, wood furniture, or a, a wooden structures for construction or metallic structure for construction, or hybrid metallic and wood structure for construction, et cetera, uh, they will typically not have the things there. They have just lots of metal. And when somebody orders, they will make the metallic piece, let's say a, a big pipe only for them. And uh, uh, when in this type of processes, uh, when a customer wants something, they ask you for a quote. They tell you, look, I want to buy 100 pipes of this length and this width with these specifications. And there is, um, a, a, uh, and I want to assemble them in this way. And then there is an engineer who looks at it and starts preparing like first, how much material and of what type, what type of metallic sheets do we need to manufacture the metallic structure you want? So they, they, that's called a bill of materials. It's like a listing of all the raw material that you need in order to manufacture the metallic structure that your customer wants. Uh, and they also then have to prepare a production plant, a production plan. So they have to say, you know, we're gonna assemble it in this way. We're first going to manufacture these, then we're gonna assemble in this way. All of these steps require some time in your manufacturing line. Uh, so you have to draw a plan, you know, when do you need which machine in your manufacturing plant? And then based on that, you have to estimate the cost of the metallic structure and the, and the delivery time on which day, how many days will it take you to deliver, to have it ready and ship it to the customer? And it used to be that there was this one, engineer doing all three tasks in this process. And that, he, that engineer at some point in time became what we call a glut, a bottleneck in the process. And to tackle that problem, it was decided to decompose that task and to give uh, the, um, the preparation, in this case, I think it was the preparation of the bill of materials. And the preparation of the production plan was done by the engineer and the estimation of the cost and the delivery time was done by another a so-called sales a manager or sales engineer who was capable of reading the bill of materials and the production plan and get all the, the prices of the raw materials and do all the costing of the production in order to produce the cost. Uh, and that allowed this company to scale up because they did not depend anymore on this one engineer to do something, but now they had the work was split between two people. It created some transportation waste because you have to move cases from the, the engineer who prepares the bills of materials to the sales manager who estimate the cost, but uh, it, makes, uh, it made the process 
uh, much more cost efficient because the alternative would have been to hire a second very highly paid engineer to, to scale up the process. Um, and even then the process will not have scaled up very well because well, engineers are not necessarily very good at chasing suppliers to get prices and discounts where sales managers are actually pretty good at that. They're good at picking the phone and just like um, uh, getting uh, estimates of costs and delivery times and negotiating with people around. So, so by splitting this task into two and giving it to two different people with two different skill sets, they could make their process more cost efficient. More generally, composition, when you merge two tasks, will improve you in terms of time, but sometimes it can have a negative effect on cost. And decomposition will make you worse in time because you introduce a weighting waste in the middle, but it will make you more efficient in terms of a, 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 a um, cost because you can, you can have two specialized people doing the two separate tasks and specialized people are usually more efficient, do things faster than generalist people. As I was saying, a sales manager can do negotiations much more effectively, much faster than what the engineer will do. The engineer can be dedicated to preparing the production plan. One important caveat is that when you merge a task and you make bigger tasks, you make your process less flexible. So, um, so you, sorry, you make your process more flexible. The more that everyone in your organization can do everything, the more you have jack of all trades in your organization, the more flexible you are because people can just move to whatever the priorities are. The more you have specialized people in your organization, the less flexible you are because you cannot have a sales manager doing preparation of production plans when the engineer is not there. They will just get stuck uh, because they don't know how to prepare a production plan. Um, whereas if you have one person able to do everything, that person can move anywhere and do any task. If you need separate people to do different things, you need to specialize you specialize your people more, you are less flexible, you can move your workforce less around the organization. So we have seen two heuristics until now. Task elimination, improve the <clears throat> cycle time of your process by eliminating non-value adding tasks or partially eliminating business value adding steps. Two, consider separating tasks or joining two tasks in order to strike trade-offs between cycle time. So when you join two tasks, you improve the cycle time because you remove the waiting time between the two tasks. And if you split the task, you can improve efficiency, therefore cost, because specialized people are faster, more efficient at doing things than generalists. The third heuristics is triage, and it is very similar to task composition and decomposition, but it just works a little bit differently. In this slide, please pay attention to task T2 on the left. So what I'm doing is that I'm proposing to take that task and to split it into two tasks, T2A and T2B. And why would I do that? You know. So these are two alternative tasks. You either do T2A and you, or you do T2B. Well, it is, it is very useful, for example, when you have a task that comes in different flavors. Let me take, for example, insurance claims. In an insurance claims company, in an insurance company, there are insurance claims for home insurance and there are insurance claims for car insurance or motor vehicle insurance, it's called. And there are claims for commercial liability insurance. And you could, let's say task T2 in this slide will be to um, assess how much we should pay for an insurance claim as an insurance company. So it's called assessing the liability. Um, that 
task assess liability, you could just have one copy of it and have a bunch of people who can assess liability for home insurance, for motor insurance, for all sorts of insurance, or you can separate them and you can have like, oh, I'm gonna have one task called assess insurance claim for home insurance. That will be T2A and T2B will be assess home insurance, uh, motor insurance claim. So for vehicles, and that will be T2B. And the second option makes is you are specializing your resources because there will be people dedicated to checking insurances, insurance claims for home insurance and a completely different set of people checking for insurance claims for motor insurance. And by making these two separated, you actually make these people more efficient. If you specialize somebody to only look at home insurance claims, you know, after doing it for 10, 15 times, they will already know most of the rules that need to be done. You know, um, after like two, three months of training, they will be able to handle these claims like, like a lightning strike, like very fast. Uh, whereas if you need to train people to know everything, it, it, it makes them slower. So they are not, when they get a home insurance claim, they have to go back and check all the rules, how much we pay for roofs that are broken in this way, etc. So specializing your resources makes your tasks faster. So in this diagram, whereas T2 might take you, let's say two hours per claim, T2A and T2B might take you only one and a half hours per claim. And it doesn't sound that much, but when you have thousand insurance claims uh, a month, then a half an hour saved per claim is already uh, 500 hours uh, saved. And that's a substantial amount of people is probably the equivalent of having saved three, person, three, three persons in the organization. And, and that can make you uh, a more reduced cost, make you more efficient. It can also reduce the effects because specialized people tend to make less errors at what they do than generalist people who tend to do many more errors because they are not able to consider all the possible nuances of how a task should be performed. An, an example of triage, for example, will be in a purchase to pay process, there are purchase requisitions of different sizes. Some of them are say for um, 10, to 1,000 euros, and another set of purchases are for expenses of more than 1,000 euros. Instead of routing all these purchase requisitions to the same approver, you could have two different approvers or two different sets of approvers. One of them is for small claims, and another one is for medium and large claims. And, and that will be make it that you consume less time from perhaps the people who have to approve large claims. They don't have to go and look at all these 500 euros type of expenses. And uh, uh, by doing that, you can free up their time for something else, for example. Or uh, the people who are approving small purchases, at some point in time, they become very good at doing it and they become just much faster at doing it than a generalist will do. Um, because they just know the rules very well and they can approve tick, tick, tick. So, and when you have a high volume business process, this can make a lot of difference. Um, and, and this in any type of process, like for example, an identity verification process, for example, you can route them. There are, you know, those who are gonna be identified using their ID card, those customers will be identified using their passport, two different things. So you can separate these two tasks and route them to different sets of people. So uh, we have seen three heuristics for improving the way tasks are performed. Eliminating the tasks, of course, whenever possible, or semi-automating a task. Two, separating one task into two sequential tasks or separating or joining two sequential tasks into one single task. And the third one is this triage, 
which is also about breaking down a task into two tasks, but each of these two tasks is for a different type of case. So you will perform for a given case in the process, you will perform either one or the other, not both. And that is good to specialize your resources. The next type of redesign heuristics I wanted to visit with you are the flow level redesign heuristics. These are the heuristics that tells you how you can change the order of your tasks in order to make them your process uh, faster or more cost effective. Let me check if everything's fine. Yeah, looks like everything is fine. No questions on the on the Zoom chat, so I keep going. Um, so I was at redesign heuristics at the flow level, and there are two of them. You can reorder or resequence the task in your process, or you can parallelize the task in your process. So heuristic number four is think about resequencing your task, and you can ask me. How can making one task before another one improve my process in any way if I still have to do the two tasks? You know, so counterintuitive. So how come I have to do a task A and a task B? And if I do B before A or A before B, I can be faster or better or less cost efficient. And it does happen. And it happens in the case where there are a uh, some is in the case of processes that sometimes stop in the middle. For example, in a purchase to requisition process, if you determine that you don't need to buy the webcam, you stop that case. It doesn't continue. Or if you determine that there is no budget for buying this webcam, you stop the process. You don't continue. The same in a, in a permit application process. When you go to the city council, and you initiate a process for getting a permit for a construction. Well, if they found that, well, uh, your house is in a zone where you know no constructions are allowed because of it's a historic zone, then the process will stop there. It will not continue. Or if they find that because of environmental reasons this construction cannot be done, the process will stop there. Will not continue. So this, these processes have a type of check that we call a knockout check. Meaning if in a case you make the check and the check is negative, so the verification is negative, the case stops. It doesn't continue. In the context of these processes, it is very good to leave the most expensive tasks until the end. And on the other hand, to bring these checks that have a strong knockout effect, meaning that knockout cases to bring them as early as possible in the process. So concretely, um, imagine that I'm gonna go back to this scenario I told you where there was this company, Metallic, that manufactured metallic products. And they, um, they had to, whenever they received a request for quote from a customer, so a customer wanted to know how much this metallic structure will cost. They will do the bill of materials. They will prepare a production plan and they will make a very detailed estimation of the cost and the delivery time. And from there, they will prepare a quote with a price and propose it to the customer. And, but they were a little bit struggling because they were spending a lot of time preparing production plans, but only 50% of the quotes they sent to the customer came back uh, uh, accepted, meaning the customer said, let's go ahead, please build this. So they were spending lots of time, and that means a lot of effort and a lot of money to prepare production plans that were basically going to the garbage bin because the customer did not, make, did not put an order afterwards. So how do you prevent that? So obviously what they did was they prepared the bill of material because this is important in order to determine the cost. And then they just estimated the amount of time 
that was needed to produce that metallic structure, but they did not build a production plan for it. And instead, in order to estimate the time, you know, they took similar works that they had done before. And from there, they, they found like the most similar order they have got before. They calculated how much time it took to make it. And they used that as their delivery uh, time. And, and then they started producing quotes in this way. No production plan, just like taking uh, an estimate of the time it takes to produce the, the, the metallic structure and then proposing that to the customer. And only once the customer said, I want to go ahead with it, then they did a detailed production plan. And sometimes they had to refine the date of delivery with the customer and say like, oh, maybe we will not be able to deliver it on the 1st of May, but we can deliver it on the 5th of May. So they made the, the adjustments that came from the production plan were made later. And why is this important? Because that means that they were only writing production plans for those customers who were ready to purchase the metallic structure, um, which means only half of the customers. For, so they had to do only half of the production plans they had to do before. It doesn't sound like a lot, but um, 50 of those, which is what they receive in one quarter, uh, that means and about five to 10 hours per production plan, that means they were saving about 400 hours of their valuable engineer's times. So the engineer was then able to handle more orders. And, and that's how they could scale up a little bit more in their business. So postponing expensive tasks, meaning tasks that take a lot of effort until you are sure that they are really needed is a strategy that can reduce your cost as this example shows. Let me give you another example where reordering tasks can be useful. In a purchase to pay process, if checking the necessity of a purchase leads to 20% of knockouts and checking the budget leads to 2% of knockouts, meaning after checking the necessity of the purchase, 20% of purchase requisitions are stopped because that purchase is not needed. Checking the budget, on the other hand, only stops 2% of the orders. So 20% versus 2%. So which one will you do first? Well, if I had a choice, I would do checking the necessity for the purchase before checking for the budget. Because that way, I eliminate 20% of the purchases. And I need to perform the task check budget 20% times less because I only need to do it for 80% of the tasks. Or let me, leave, let me give you another example. It used to be, this is, I was really, I was involved in the university admission process at the University of Tartu back in 2009, 2012, 2013. Uh, when University of Tartu started running international master's program and started getting international students. And at the time, you know, I noticed that the process was very inefficient because there was an admissions office somewhere in the main building that were examining to death every single application. And there were quite a lot of applications uh, in order to check quite a lot of um, details. Like, for example, uh, are the degrees valid? And they were sending them to Tallinn to check and getting them back and all sorts of things going on there, checking the English language tests, asking for a lot of documents from the from the from the, the potential applicants to the applicants for studies. And, and at the end, anyway, because we had a limited number of places, 80% of the applications were being rejected just because we needed to be selective because the number of places we study places we had was far lower than the number of applicants we had. So how much waste doing, let's say at some point in time, we were receiving about 2,000 to 3,000 applications across the university, doing a lot of minutious checks on 3,000 applications so that at the end, we reject 80% of them. So 80% of all those checks were actually not necessary because the admission committee will have rejected them. 
So this process needed to be redesigned to bring a little bit forth the work of the admission committee. So the admission committee classifies the applications and say, well, these are likely rejects, these are possible accepts. And then we then, the admissions office does not need to do all the verifications for those 80% of students that will be rejected anyway. And that made the process more cost efficient and actually also faster because the admissions office was not delaying the admissions committee work anymore. Uh, they were like doing minor checks, passing to admissions committee, admissions committee classified, and then the admissions office only needed to do check on a much smaller number of, of students. The knockout check, which was the one of the admissions committee, which decides like to reject 80% of the application, was, bring, was brought forth. I think you are going to get this case study of the University of Tartu admission process around 2012 uh, as one of the uh, exercises in your lab sessions uh, later today. Uh, there are a lot of other things that can be improved in that process, of course, and that were improved subsequently uh, around 2016, 2017. So resequencing tasks when there are knockout checks in your process can improve your cycle time. And sometimes it can also, sorry, it can improve your cost for sure, because you only perform certain tasks when they are needed. And sometimes it can also improve your cycle times as well, because then you have less work to do. And if you have less work to do, there are lower resource utilization, lower waiting times. The fifth redesign heuristic, and we are already a bit more than midway through it, is parallelism enhancement, which means consider making multiple tasks in parallel. And what does that give you? When you parallelize two tasks, when you make them in parallel, instead of making them in sequence, you reduce, you eliminate the waiting time between these two tasks. And you also... Um, uh, by making them parallel, you reduce the overall cycle time because remember the cycle time of a block, a parallel block is equal to the maximum of the cycle times of the tasks in the block as opposed to the sum. And usually, well, <laughs> not usually, but always, the, the sum of two numbers is larger than the maximum of those two numbers. So by putting them in parallel, you, you are maximizing, uh, a, you, are, you are reducing the cycle time. Um, for example, in a procure to pay process, you might consider if you have two purchase approvals, approved budget, approved necessities for the purchase. And if you determine that, well, they do need to be done by two different people, there is no way of joining these two tasks. The alternative will be to make them in parallel. So instead of like, you know, I send the person requisition to supervisor one who does one approval, and then it goes to supervisor two who does the second approval, you know, we do the two approvals in parallel. And if each of the two approvals takes two hours, then the whole parallel block will take two hours in terms of cycle time. Beware in terms of cycle time. It doesn't reduce the effort that is needed to handle these or purchases, these approvals. It reduces the cycle time of the process. So in other words, and that's what this legend at the top of the slide means, T plus, C minus, it improves the time, but it does not necessarily improve the cost. In fact, sometimes making things in parallel can decrease, can, can make the cost worse, which means can increase costs. How can that happen? Well, if before you did approve necessity of purchase first, and then you do approved budget second, then approved budget was only executed for 80% of the tasks because 20% of the tasks were eliminated, of the cases were eliminated by the first approval. Whereas if you do them in parallel, you have to then perform both tasks. And then performing two tasks is more effort and therefore takes more resource cost than performing a, only the first task because the second is not needed. So if you do the calculations, 
sometimes doing in sequence when there is a knockout check in the middle is faster, is, is less effort than doing in parallel. On the other hand, doing in parallel gives you more speed. Your cycle time is reduced because parallel blocks take less cycle time. When you parallelize things, you reduce the cycle times. So we are done with the task level heuristics. Eliminate, decompose, or compose. Triage, make multiple variants of a task. Resequence, particularly when there are knockout checks, bring the most discriminative check, the one that knocks out the most cases, put it at the start. Most expensive tasks, put them at the end and parallelize your tasks in order to reduce cycle times. Those are the first five heuristics. Uh, the remaining heuristics work at a more macro level, not at the level of individual tasks, but at the level of the entire process. The heuristic number six is called special, process specialization or standardization. Specializing a process means that instead of having one single process with one process owner and a single set of people doing that process, you can copy it and make two separate processes that handle different uh, uh, types of customers or different geographies. Like for example, if you are a company that traditionally was operating in Estonia, and at some point in time, you started getting customers from Finland, and, and then you started serving them with exactly the same process. But then you discover that you run into a lot of troubles because for example, deliveries in Finland is a separate beast. Um, you know, talking to customers in Finland is big, big is a different beast. Um, you know, initially you were trying to patch it by having one Finnish speaking people in your customer service team, but after a while that doesn't scale. So at some point in time, you might say, bugger off. Let's have one process for handling purchase orders coming from Estonia and a separate process for handling purchase orders from Finland. Let's have two different resource sets of people doing it and let the process be different if they need to be different because maybe um, the way deliveries are handled in Finland is completely different from the way it is handled in Estonia. So that's called process specialization. I decided to split my order to cash process into two, one for Estonia, one for Finland but it could be one process for um, retail customers and another one for wholesale customers. That's also possible. Uh, the second type of uh, um, the reverse of specialization is a standardization. A standardization means you currently are running multiple processes that look very similar, but they have some differences. Like for example, one order to cash process for Estonia, one for Latvia and one from Lithuania, and you merge them together. And you say, let's bring them all together. And what does it mean to bring them all together? It's like everybody who worked, all the sets of people who were employed in these three processes are gonna now form a single team. And there's gonna be a single manager called the process owner, you know, managing them. And, and, and then they are, and, and we're gonna make the process more streamlined where maybe we're doing a little bit things differently in Lithuania. No, we are gonna, not gonna do them like that anymore. We're gonna do everything like we used to, be, to do it in Estonia, for example, for all cases. Um, so what is the trade-off between these two? To, for that, let me give you an example. So I, I was, as I said, consulting for some insurance company and then insurance companies, they always have this trade-off. Do we have one process for handling motor vehicle claims and another process for home claims or for commercial liability claims? Or should we have a single process? And over time, depending on the emphasis of the company, we call that the company strategy, these processes were standardized or specialized. And the trade-off was the following one. If the company was in a strategy of cutting costs, and sometimes that was necessary because they had cost blowouts or because their competitors 
were pushing prices down and they needed to reduce costs to be competitive in terms of price, then they started standardizing. Because standardizing, making everything the same, bringing all these claims handlers together, allows you to handle more work with less people. This is because when you have bigger pools of people doing a process, say 100 people doing the insurance claims, both for home and for motor vehicle, is very powerful. You can, you can push the resource utilization up to 95, 96, 97%, which means your claims handlers have a lot of work to do. So you are using them to the maximum extent. And still, the waiting times for handling claims are very low. That's what queuing theory tells you. Whereas if you have two or three separate pools, say three separate pools, each with around 30 people, and whenever you reach about 90, 95 resource percent of resource utilization in one of these processes, you will feel how bad the waiting times will start going after that. So you have to hire more people. So in a way, if you had say 40 people in three different processes, 120 in total, and you manage to join them into one single resource pool, instead of 40 plus 40 plus 40, you might actually only need a around 100 people. So 100 people can replace 120 people when you standardize. Uh, also standardization can help you to eliminate some exceptions and deviations in your process that cost you additional effort and therefore reduce the effort further. So if an insurance company is cost cutting mode, they will try to join all their processes for insurance claims handling into one standardize. On the other hand, if they are more in a strategy of improving customer service, uh, reducing defect rates, uh, improving execution times, then they will probably go for a strategy of special, specializing their processes so that motor vehicle process is handled by specialists in motor vehicle insurance. And these specialists are gonna make this process much faster than the people who have to know about every single type of insurance claim. All right. Um, the seventh heuristic is called resource optimization. It's actually not one heuristic, but it's several recommendations on how you should arrange your, the resources, the human resources of your process. The first thing, and this is very relevant in your homework, uh, homework number three is if there are multiple people doing the same types of tasks in different geographic regions, in different places, try to treat them as if they were sitting in the same room. So just imagine what will be if these people sitting in 50 different geographic locations were working in the same virtual room and they could take, you know, one person could take work that happens in another geographic location or vice versa. So you get the power of having a large resource pool uh, to handle all these uh, workloads that you get. So larger resource pools are more resilient, are more powerful. You know, they can handle a lot of workload. Uh, uh, very, They can eat a, a lot of workload. Smaller resource pools means that there are two people sitting in one place who have very little work. And then there are two people doing the same thing somewhere else who have a lot of work. So long waiting times here, while the other people are idle. Specializing your resources is a good strategy for reducing cost. You know, that's what you know, is done in, in, uh, um, in factories, but everywhere, even in software development processes, you know, you have people who are testers, you are people who are technical writers doing documentation, uh, you have people who are doing development, you have people who are doing infrastructure management, etc. because then people become very efficient at doing something. Very efficient means they can do more instances of a task per time unit. Uh, so split the work, split the resources in such a way that everybody is exploiting their skills to the maximum possible extent. 
Now, when you allocate resources to a given task, so there is, a, 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 for example, an insurance claim, and let's say you have a senior person who can handle all sorts of claims and a junior person who can only handle certain types of claims, like, for example, small vehicle claims. And there is a claim coming in for a small vehicle claim. Always give it to the most specialized resource, in this case, the person who can only handle that kind of claims, so that you leave your more generalist resource for uh, a, a, the next time. So if the next task comes and it's a home insurance claim, you can give it to the senior person. So first, give work to the specialist and then to the generalist and not the other way around. Uh, in the, in the um, a prescription fulfillment process, you kind of have a similar situation. You have a technician and you have a pharmacist. All the tasks that the technician does could be done by the pharmacist. There is no problem. Now, the pharmacist could be handing off the prescription to the customer. Uh, the pharmacist could be entering data into the pharmacy information system. Uh, but whenever you can, you give the work to the specialist, to, to the technician. Um, and you leave the pharmacist only for those cases where they are really needed. Also because it's a more expensive resource. Um, and then there are all sorts of techniques, maybe a little bit advanced, and I'm not going to go deep into them, but just wanted to mention them. Like, for example, batching. If instead of every time that a prescription arrives, for example, you go and do a check, you can batch them. You can get 20 prescriptions in a row and do them in a single go. Bam, 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 bam. Have a technician just taking 20 prescriptions and doing insurance checks for an hour. Bam, 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 bam. They will do 20 in one hour. Whereas if the technician is, every time a new prescription goes in, the prescription, the technician is running and checking it and then he goes and does something or she goes and does something else. And then another prescription comes by and she goes, he go, the person, the technician goes back and checks it. That is going to take more time because of context switches, opening the prescription, you know, opening the insurance system, doing the verifications, etc., and then going away, then coming back. These things are called context switches and context switches slow down your process. If you can just put 20 prescriptions in front of a technician and have them do doing it one after another, after another, after another, you will be able to do more work in less time. That is called patching. You know, you take, you don't, you don't handle one prescription at a time. You wait until there are 20 prescriptions in a go. You give them to a person and off they go. For example, you get someone at 7 a.m. in the morning handling all the orders that were received the, the previous evening. And then they just go and enter the prescription bam, 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 from seven to eight. At eight o'clock, all the prescriptions are already, all the prescriptions that were submitted during the night have already been entered. Uh, so here, an example, I, I, I just gave now an example of how to do batching and uh, uh, how to do integration. For example, if you have claims handler in different regions, in different countries, in different states, you might want to bring them together to share the work. When you share the work with a large number of people, you know you can just be together much, much more efficient uh, in terms of like achieve more work with less waiting time. Heuristic number eight, and possibly one of the ones, the most important ones in the sense that it brings the highest amount of benefits is optimizing the communication in your process. It's a little bit abstract at this stage. Bear with me and I will give you some examples. So in a business process, you need to make sure that you optimize the number of interactions. You want to interact with your customer, yes, but you want to have the, exactly the right amount of interaction points in your, with your customer so that it does not slow down your process. Imagine if you had a process uh, where every few, you, you ask for, you order something and every hour you get some question about it and you're not available to answer it. So you, get the, you answer it like a few hours later and then later you get another question. 
and you have to answer it again. And later you get another question and you have to answer it again. So, so that will slow down a lot the process. If, if the pharmacy needs to ask you something, it will be better if they ask it to you in a single go and not in multiple pieces. Uh, because otherwise we are delaying the process for everybody. Very important to when you interact with a customer or with a business partner to select, do you use synchronous interaction like telephone call uh, or, a, or chat, or do you use asynchronous interaction like email? The choice of interactions depends on what you are, what type of uh, work you are dealing with, as you will see in a minute. And very important, the timing of the interactions. As a general rule, an interaction that allows you to find a problem that you need to know about in a process is better done at the start of the process than at the end of the process. This is, this is something that applies everywhere, everywhere. Detect the defects as early as possible. So interactions that are there to detect some issue should be done as early as possible in the process and not at the end of the process. In terms of optimizing the number of interactions, you should always design your process in such a way that you get sufficient information to your, from your customers to take you until the next milestone in your process. So you always see your process as a, as a sequence of milestones. You know, from a, we saw it when we did value chain modeling. From, from a prescription, you want to get to the point where the prescription is verified. From the moment it is verified, you want to get to a point where it's ready to be delivered. And from the moment that it's delivered, you want to get to the point where it is handed off and paid. So there are three milestones in your process. You want that at the beginning of the process, you have enough information as early as possible to get you to the point where your prescription is fully verified as much as you can. With respect to the types of interactions, the general principle is that synchronous interactions like chat or telephone are very good for solving minor defects. So if you have some potentially minor question or defect to ask, think about doing it synchronously to speed up things. On the other hand, asynchronous communication like email communication is better to do notifications and to resolve major defects, such as requesting for additional information in order to reach the next milestone in your process. <clears throat> and finally, when it comes to optimizing the timing of the interaction, you have to strike a trade-off between front-loading your, not front-loading your process too much and not back-loading your process too much. Uh, this is very important. It's a very important concept. In your process, there are you, you communicate with the customer, with suppliers, or with a doctor, or with an insurance company, all sorts of interactions you have to get there. Uh, you should make sure that you do not prevent you, you do not put too many interactions at the start because that's going to prevent work from starting, but also do not put too many interactions at the end, because then you will not be able to detect issues until the very end of your process. And in that respect, it's very, it's very good to think about how does a process that is front loaded look like? A front loaded process is a process that applies the so-called complete kit principle. The complete kit design of a, a, a process is designed using the complete kit when you tell to the customer, we are not going to start working until you give me all the information I need to start. You will find such processes in government agencies because they have a monopoly. They are able to do these things. You want a passport or you want an ID card or you want a permit for something. Um, guess what? The process will not start until you fill in three pages form and you attach 10 documents to it. Um, uh, of course, that's not very customer friendly. It's also not very efficient because the moment the process, uh, uh, because if something is missing, you don't do anything. 
you just wait for this additional birth certificate of your grandparent that was needed to start the process. That means that you have to spend two or two, two, two weeks getting the document, bring them, and only then the process starts. And maybe then they find that actually you need some other document, etc. So, so these are front-loaded process. We call them also complete kit processes because they only start when all the information needed to start them is ready. Very tricky. Usually, these are very customer-friendly processes. The reverse of that is a backloaded process. Um, a a backloaded process a, is a process where you just let things happen. And then you figure out at the end, you know, if there are any issues. Remember the process I mentioned last week from Ford in the 1980s slash beginning of the 90s? They were running their procurement process in a backloaded manner. Somebody purchased something, purchase requisition, the purchase order was sent to the accounts payable department. When something got delivered, the delivery receipts got sent to the accounts payable department. When an invoice arrived, it just got sent to the accounts payable department. And one day, like many weeks later, somebody in accounts payable department will see an invoice and will start asking, hey, where's the purchase order for this invoice? Oh, hey, have we received the items that are listed in this invoice? So only at the end of the process, they started wondering, uh, do we actually have all the information we need in order to pay this invoice? So it's better to start gathering this information much earlier so that defects like, for example, a product was ordered but was delivered and rejected, that those defects are detected as early as possible and not at the very end of the process. So avoid backloaded processes. The ninth redesign heuristic is automation. And I make it on purpose to put it at the end. Because automation efficient automation applied to an inefficient operation makes it more inefficient. So before you think about, I'm going to automate part of the process, stop. Look at all the other eight redesign heuristics. See if they can be applied. You know, apply them and then automate the redesign process. That makes your automation so much more efficient because you're automating the right thing. You're not automating stuff that doesn't need to be done. You're not automating stuff that is being done too late. You are not uh, trying to automate stuff that actually needs to be you know, checked manually. So because you have gone through all the previous redesign heuristics before. And automation has roughly five facets to it. In auto, sorry, business process automation have fast, first five facets to it. Facet number one is you should consider using data sharing technology, uh, package enterprise systems like customer relationship management systems, enterprise resource planning systems, project management systems, etc., to increase the availability of information related to your process to all take stakeholders and give them the required information to make their decisions. Also to avoid duplicate data entry and to avoid sending emails around, but instead all the information is in the enterprise system. Use network technology, exploit rather network technology to replace all your physical paper flows with electronic paper flows, with information flows. Use also network technology exploited in order to provide as much self-service as you want, as you can uh, to the customers of your processes so that they can themselves enter their purchase orders or their purchase requisitions, etc. Use tracking technology, barcodes, barcodes, very important, another gift for your homework. I'm gonna give you another gift for your homework. Barcodes is a tracking technology that allows you to link physical objects in your process with digital records. Very useful if you have a situation where you need to know, for example, whose box is this one, or whose bag is this one, or what's in there. And in this prescription process, there are some bags hang hanging, hanging around in the process. So barcodes can be useful because then you scan them and you can link that bag, a physical object, 
to a digital record, and that can speed up your process. Uh, and RFID codes is kind of similar, but in addition, you don't need to really go and scan, but it can be detected automatically by a sensor. Um, if you have resources moving around in a big area, then consider using GPS in order to locate them and optimize the process. This is particularly important in the context of logistics or transportation processes. Use business rules technology um, to uh, automate as much as possible your, if your decision tasks when you need to take decisions. And this is something we will see next week. Let's use business process management systems to coordinate to automate the coordination of your process so that handovers from one task to another, from one person to another in the process are automatically handled. Reminders of tasks that need to be done are automatically sent uh, by a system. So, and, and everybody in the organization knows when they need to perform some task and they are not delaying other people. So we are gonna see that type of technology called business process management system uh, in the next two lessons. Uh, this is just a summary of the five types of technologies that can help you to automate different aspects of your process or different facets of your process. To conclude today's lecture, and I know I'm a little bit late, um, let me take back the example of the equipment rental process at a construction company that we have seen before, where a site engineer needs to hire some equipment submits an equipment rental request, which is reviewed by a clerk fi who finds the right equipment, um, maybe has to iterate with multiple suppliers to find the right equipment, re pass it on to the works engineer, who is the one who has the budget, who approves the rental request or rejects it. And if it, they approve it, the clerk creates a purchase order and the process continues, uh, so on. So here, there is an excellent opportunity for using task elimination. So in the case of low value equipments, like for example, a water pump that costs like 50 euros a day to rent, you know, we could only in those cases, not in all cases, but only in those cases, we could eliminate the task review rental request and allow the site engineer to decide that they need a water pump. And it's such a low value added equipment that there's no point in waiting for the works engineer to approve that request. That site engineer can just get it straight away. Um, let's assume we decide to, to remove that for small equipment, at least we get a much simpler, more streamlined process, but we can do more for those cases. We can compose multiple tasks. Uh, for example, um, task composition, instead of, Site engineer fills in a form, clerk reviews it, looks in a catalog, uh, then contacts the supplier to check the availability, etc. Why not set up a self-service system that will allow the site engineer themselves to create, to look at the catalog, pick up the equipment they want to, uh, to rent, select it, and create the purchase requisition straight away from there. If you, we manage to do that, which means we compose all the first three tasks in this process into a single one, then we will be eliminating a lot of transportation waste and therefore reducing the cycle time of the process and also making it more efficient because we don't need to have the clerk in the middle. Heuristic number six tells you, hey guys, you have small purchases and you have large purchases. What about you specialize them? Small purchases, you can do them using container-based trading, which means ask the supplier to put a container with all the small pieces of equipment you might need. If a site engineer needs one, they go into the container, they scan the equipment they want to rent, and they use it. And when they are done, they come and put it back. And then we have a framework agreement where we pay to the supplier for the amount of hours when we use this container. That's called vendor-managed inventory control, as we saw last week, VMI. So we could do VMI for small equipment and make it much faster. For larger equipment, on the other hand, we could go through all these process that we have set up here, or maybe we can streamline it in a different way. Heuristic number eight, communication optimization tells you, 
Like instead of just popping up at the construction site with a bulldozer, what about we send a reminder to the, a, a notification to the site engineer that this and this such and such equipment will be delivered tomorrow. And we allow them to confirm that they are ready to accept delivery of this by replying to an SMS. They can confirm that they are ready to take delivery of this equipment and they can indicate what is the optimal time for them to receive it. So that communication allows us to be more timely when we arrive to the construction site to deliver this bulldozer so that the site engineer is not surprised to see the bulldozer popping up at eight o'clock in the morning when they only needed it at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, so there are many other places in this process where, you know, for example, in relation to extensions of rental equipment rental where you could optimize the process. Um, the output of all applying these heuristics is, as we can see in this image, a redesigned process. And you can further improve this process by introducing some automation. For example, a self-service system that allows the site engineer to enter the uh, rental request themselves, uh, check the availability of the equipment themselves, turn that into a purchase order, and track the status of the delivery of that purchase order at every point in time, cancel it, request an extension of the deadline, et cetera. And this automation can be introduced once you have a streamlined, redesigned process. So, and you can use automation to set up a self-service or to notify different stakeholders when they need to perform a task. Uh, by means of a process automation platform or a business process management system. Correct. So there are many ideas coming out from the redesign heuristics on how we can improve this process. And today, during the practice session um, with Maria, you are going to be able to do uh, to apply these heuristics to another scenario of a university admission process, I believe. And uh, after that, please start with your homework where you need to apply the business process for engineering principles we saw last week and the nine redesign heuristics we saw this week to um, the prescription fulfillment process. And with that, we will close on the topic of business process redesign. Next week, uh, we will change topics and we will start with the topic of business process automation, 